uh, good evening, everybody. My name is David Tarpey of NC State University's Apiculture Program, along here with other members of the program, and of course, as always, the NCDA apiary inspectors um, who do a fantastic job going out and making sure that our, our bees are, are healthy. Um, thank you for joining Apiculture Online, Hive Chat with NC State. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, to all of those of you that are watching on our live stream. Uh, feel free to comment and to upvote and like uh, all of the different videos and all the recordings that we have through this, this entire seminar series. We really have a fantastic lineup tonight, uh, really terrific discussion topics um, and fantastic uh, guests as usual. Um, but first, as always, uh, we want to start with a, just a quick announcement. Uh, and once again, want to make sure that everybody knows about our next upcoming Bees Academy. So this is for intermediate beekeepers. Those of you who have already taken your beginner bee school, you've had one, two, three years of keeping bees, but you feel like you need to take that next step or as we like to say, it have a booster shot to your beginner bee school and to kind of revisit some of those topics to, to really reinforce those different topics and, and skills of beekeeping to, to take you to that next level. It's gonna be held the first weekend of October. So that's gonna be Saturday and Sunday, October 2nd and 3rd in Monroe, North Carolina. They're really fantastic uh, County Extension Center there in Union County. So uh, more information about that online on our website uh, about the Bees Academy and, and how, to, uh, how to enroll and to register. So uh, feel free to, uh, to, to check that out. But first, as we always do, um, we're going to talk about the bees in season, uh, which is in essence going over biologically what your bees are doing right now and what you should be doing as a beekeeper in order to, to help them during this, this time of year. And, you know, August, September, late summer, early fall is perhaps the most stressful time for honeybees and therefore one of the more difficult times for beekeepers. It's still really kind of raging hot out there. So bees are still collecting a lot of water. But oftentimes in most areas, there's a really poor nectar flow, which can lead to really bad robbing between colonies. If you have really big colonies versus really small colonies, so you need to take care of that. It's hard for them to keep brood rearing if there's not a lot of nectar flow coming in uh, and or pollen flow. It's also, as we'll be talking about much more in detail later, the mite populations are really ramping up and, and really hitting their maximal growth and, and population levels. So it's the primary concern, number one concern of beekeepers in general, really all year round. But right now it is particularly acute because the bees are brooding down, you know, they're kind of going into the fall, going into winter where they're not keeping their population as high as they do through the summer. So the queen isn't laying as many eggs. The brood level starts to go down, but the mite level starts to really come up. And so that's where the percentage of mites within colonies can, can really start to accelerate this time of year. So all the downhill sledding from the spring when you have the nectar flow and they're building up and, you know, making comb and everything's just great. But during the summer and especially this time of year, all of that really stops and it just makes it really, really hard. It's, it's really uphill sledding when it comes to beekeeping right now. So you need to stick with it, make sure that you're up to the challenge and, uh, and, and keep helping your bees during this most stressful time. This is particularly true because stressed bees are much more susceptible to all sorts of problems. So when they're stressed out because they're nutritionally deprived and they're kind of being parasitized and all these other things, even minor problems like small hive beetles, they can keep small hive beetles at bay during the spring. But when they're stressed out this time of year, maybe the small hive beetles can start to take its toll. Um, different diseases can certainly start cropping up uh, this time of year. Um, things like sac brood or some of these other 
kind of minor stressor diseases, they can start to manifest because they're being stressed out in these different ways, which then makes these relatively minor things uh, pop up. But of course, you know, you really need to be going in fairly frequently monitoring for your mites. Can't stress that enough. We've done this over and over again on Apiculture Online. If you want uh, different lectures about how to monitor for mites, uh, different control measures that you can use, go back into our uh, recorded video banks and uh, watch those, those videos as well to familiarize yourself with those. I won't kind of go back over them necessarily here, but make sure that you're on top and you're going into the colonies frequently enough where you can monitor for the mites and check for some of these other stressors that may manifest. Brood patterns especially is one of those things to be looking out for. So, you know, you can go into colonies and you can see brood patterns like this, this time of year, where, you know, you have a lot of empty cells in what's supposed to be a contiguous area of capped brood, but a lot of them are kind of chewed open, that kind of thing, or some other pictures of it, maybe a better, higher resolution of it where you see them. Um, the, the bees are uncapping the cappings, sometimes even chewing and decapitating the, the pupa that's inside, um, even, you know, removing such a great majority of the capped brood that it looks, you know, pretty much empty. You know, all these are examples of parasitic mite syndrome, PMS, or even idiopathic brood disease syndrome, where, which is in essence, PMS, you know, mites, but without huge numbers of mites. So you can still have a mite problem if you don't have huge numbers of mites. It can often depend on how many viruses are within the system and is being circulated by the mites and, uh, and within the bees. So you can have really, really bad brood patterns because of uh, the mites and you might not realize it until it's too late. So uh, definitely be on the lookout for these types of situations. Now, again, the, the thing to do as a beekeeper is that you want to be predicting where the bees are going to be one to two brood cycles from now. So that's three to six weeks ahead of time. So where are they going to be next month? And what can you do as a beekeeper right now to help them grow into or to ease into that transition, right? And so, you know, a month from now, it's really not going to be a whole lot different. They're still going to be slowly brooding down. It's still going to be fairly hot. They're still going to be fairly stressed with mites and with the lack of forage. So you need to be continued to be vigilant with those problems and again, address them as soon as you can. And when you see them, if they're having brood disease problems or mite issues, uh, you need to take control measures immediately. So that means you need to be regularly monitoring for those mites and taking those control measures. Hopefully you've been taking certain passive control measures or things all along that you have a mite control strategy, uh, but you might need to step in with some other measure if those uh, kind of passive control measures are not working. Another thing to do within the next you know, couple months is to start thinking about your overwintering plan and what you're going to do going into the winter. Uniting hives, making sure they have sufficient honey stores, you know, combining frames uh, among colonies, again, assuming that they're not, you know, diseased or anything, but it's far, far better to go into the winter with strong, well-stocked colonies, um, one strong, well-stocked colonies, rather than two or three weaker colonies that you need to, that you think you can nurse through the winter. Um, the old adage among beekeepers is take your winter losses in the fall. And so this is a great way to be thinking about that is to, to really combine your resources, make sure that your colonies are going strong into winter. And even if that means you need to cull or to unite some of your colonies, that's, that's the way to go. So um, let me check to see if there's uh, any questions on the 
YouTube chat. I don't see any, but as we go along, those of you that are watching us on YouTube, uh, feel free to uh, put something in the chat if you have any questions, and uh, we will try to get to them. Of course, the last, last 15 minutes, we'll open it up to an open Q&A, uh, and you can save your questions till then as well. So with that, uh, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for both our discussion and for our special guests. And so usually our third segment of Apiculture Online is our interview, uh, guest interview with our special guests. But I'm going to uh, reverse the order here, and we're actually going to um, invite our guest to not only uh, tell us about her program and what uh, she has going on, but then also join with our uh, group discussion roundtable uh, about varroa mites, because she's one of the world's experts on that subject. And that's Dr. Gloria de Grandy Hoffman, who is the research leader, kind of the department head of the USDA Agricultural Research Service B Lab, uh, uh, the Carl Hayden B Lab in Tucson, Arizona. And she has been research leader for uh, over 20 years, if I'm uh, not mistaken, Gloria, which is by far the longest serving research leader at any of the uh, Honeybee ARS uh, USDA labs, and probably only second to the longest serving ever to Tom Rinder. <laughs> Um, at the Baton Rouge, she served for like, what, 50 years or something. So that's, uh, you know, <laughs> um, that he'll, he'll always be the longest ever serving. But you have been in that position for a very, very long time and have done a fantastic job in building up that program and bringing on a lot of the excellent scientists, some of whom we've had on Apiculture Online before. And so it's a real pleasure to have you here tonight, Gloria. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dave. Uh, uh, yeah, I, um, I, I have been a research leader for uh, quite a while. The years uh, fly by, uh, and uh, we do have a tremendous staff uh, at the uh, at the B Lab, and maybe that's why I've been research leader for for, for so long. They're, the folks there are so much fun to work with, and uh, I enjoy what I do so much that. Uh, yeah, I'm still mm -hmm. doing it. <laughs> well, you know, I think one of the things that I think many of the people who are viewing this tonight may may or may not realize is that there's there used to be five, but now there are four uh, ARS B, uh, B labs. One, and, and they all focus on different aspects of bees and pollinators. One, the one in Logan, Utah, focuses on non-honeybee pollinators. The other three focus on honeybees, but they all kind of phase shift um, from each other, and they have slightly different uh, emphases on, on what they tend to specialize on. And so yours has, for a very, very long time, really been focused on Africanized bees and pollination and, and overall bee health. So um, tell us a little bit about those uh, kind of specialty aspects of what you guys have been doing there in Tucson. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, we did uh, work a, a great deal with African bees and, and did work with pollination. But uh, when uh, colony collapse disorder uh, occurred, uh, we, we broadened our uh, research topics. And uh, in response to the beekeepers, particularly those who uh, were taking their colonies out to almonds, uh, they needed to get a better grip on colony nutrition. That was uh, really a, a challenge that they had because they were taking their colonies out to uh, uh, California and there just wasn't a lot of forage out there for yeah. us. So they take their colonies out there in November and uh, you know you couldn't find a flowering plant until the, the uh, almonds began to bloom. So uh, we developed a protein supplement diet, but in that, that process, really went back to being a nutrition lab and yeah. nutrition in the broadest uh, sense. And uh, um, so I got into nutrition uh, research uh, as, uh, you know, some of you may know, uh, really my training is in mathematical modeling. So uh, I look at populations and factors that uh, influence uh, the growth of populations, but also uh, things that cause populations to crash 
And uh, that's how uh, we got into things like Varroa mites uh, because they could sure crash a population. And so we built models as to you know, why uh, mites were causing populations to crash and really got into looking at the age structure of the population. And I can't emphasize that enough that uh, um, a colony of bees is a numbers game. And uh, um, Dave brought up some of those uh, points uh, in his introduction about looking at the brood and, and thinking, uh, you know, two, three weeks in advance, because the problems that you see now will manifest themselves in your colony population two or three weeks from now. And uh, so, you know, getting back to the nutrition uh, reduction and longevity of bees, and uh, that's corrupts the age structure of a colony and can set it up for a crash, even though you may have 30,000 bees in a colony right now, they're all short-lived bees and that brood rearing is going down um, three weeks from now, six weeks from now, that colony will start to go into a tumble that you can't pull it out of because they're not rearing enough brood. They don't have enough bees to rear enough brood. Right. And you begin to have this downward spiral that you, you, the only way to pull them out is like Dave said, start combining your colony. So um, we look at nutrition in terms of how it affects pheromones. And I know you had uh, uh, Mark Carroll Mark Her- uh, yeah. here yep. and, and talked about that. Um, how uh, nutrition affects the physiology of bees. And uh, that's uh, uh, Vanessa Corby Harris is our physiologist. Uh, how it affects a colony's uh, ability to thermoregulate and to essentially act as a cohesive unit. And uh, that's William Meekle's work who does continuous monitoring of colonies and can detect uh, these effects of poor nutrition or pesticides or mites on the ability of bees to um, you know, maintain a homeostasis in their colonies. Right, right. And uh, um, nutrition also affects the microbiome of the colony. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, those you know, bacteria that uh, are really an extension of the immune system. And that's Kirk Anderson's work. The beneficial so have, bacteria that live in their guts. Yes, right. exactly, Dave. Yeah. And so um, we really um, have... Uh, uh, as a goal is to look at uh, um, nutrition in in a, uh, a complete sense from uh, um, the what's going on in the gut of a bee all the way out to what's going on with the population yeah. in a colony. Well, and I think that really underscores just the, the complexity of bees and, and beekeeping, right? But that you really need to look at it as a whole system, right? It's just the entire system from each individual bee how they function together as a colony, and then how they interface with their environment. All three of those levels are, are really, really critical. And you can't ignore, you can't just focus on one and ignore the others. They, they all have to go together. And so I think that's really great. And the team that you've built there um, over the years has is, is really been fantastic. And, um, and we really appreciate all of that. You were mentioning about uh, your mathematical models on Varroa mites, um, which are kind of some of the the real standards of of how to look at those age demographics and whatnot. Let's unpack that a a little bit more, um, because we have talked in the past about the importance of the um, uh, diatinous bees, the winter bees, right, that are physiologically different. so they're not here in North Carolina or in the Southeast, you know, we don't, we have a pretty mild winter, just like you do in, in Arizona. Um, and so, you know, the question is whether or not they really have a lot of these winter bees that are supposed to be long lived, but of course they do. Um, they're not going to be reared yet for another couple brood cycles, but it's really, really important to make sure, as you said, that the demographics of the colony is going in well to that time when they're making those winter bees. So what is your, what is your models kind of been predicting about the importance of that? Those last few brood cycles, you want them to be the healthiest bees in your colony, the most long lived bees in your colony. And, and uh, that can happen by controlling mites early on um, because 
if when you look at a colony and you see the mite population going up, you can also picture it as seeing virus population going up, Correct. particularly deformed wing virus. Mm -hmm. And high titers of deformed wing virus cause uh, a reduction in longevity of bees. Okay. And so, um, you know, controlling the uh, mites, particularly as you go into the fall, is key to also controlling deformed wing virus and, and um, putting the uh, odds in your favor of having a high proportion of long-lived bees going into the winter. Because, you know, when you get into spring dwindling, that colony population is, is going to drop. Yep. And how far it drops is going to depend on the proportion of long-lived bees that you went into the winter with. And if you don't have many of them, that spring dwindling will get down to a point where now the colony can't write itself. So have and, there uh, been studies on the proportion of those long-lived bees in the southern tier? Um, you know, so com compared to way up north where, you know, a, a high proportion, if not all of them, are, need to be those long-lived winter bees that need to live you know, six months or so. Right. So I think that that's pretty clear, but in the Southern tier, you know, ha have there been studies of looking at what is that critical proportion that, that they need to make it through to the next one, even though the winter may not be as long or as harsh. I haven't seen studies where I give you an exact proportion. And some of it uh, is tied with when the queen begins to, to lay eggs again. Right. And knowing that, whenever she begins to lay again, it's gonna be three weeks before adults emerge and begin to replace those bees that are dying that were born the previous fall. So, I mean, that's where the spring dwindling comes in is that if the bees are dying faster than the new bees are emerging, population is dropping and, and if it drops to a point where there now there aren't enough bees to rear enough brood, the colony can't pull itself out of that. Yeah. But an exact proportion I, I, for um, the latitude where North Carolina is, I, I can't, I, I don't yeah. know if that be a particular number. I mean, I guess it's more of a rhetorical question about, you know, like just kind of how critical they are. But I think the takeaway and certainly from your models, the more, the better, right? Like, so yeah. the healthier and the long, the healthier they are, the longer lived they're going to be, even if they're not winter bees per se. Right. right. So, you know, that's really the take home message is, and I, I like the way you put that the bees this time of year and going into rearing those winter bees, they need to be the healthiest they are all year long. Um, and I think nature has it where it's almost the exact opposite, right? Nature would have it right now. They're the most stressed out. Um, it's the most yeah. difficult time of year to keep them healthy. So it's just, you know, something for everybody to keep in mind. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what mites do. You know, and that's been the real challenge with mites is, as you mentioned in your introduction, they, they're at the highest level right now. Yeah. And virus levels are at their highest levels right yeah. now. And we also have uh, the problem of, you know, the mites that you have in your colony today can be a lot different than the mites you're going to have in your colony a week from now because of the migratory nature that varroa mites have acquired. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, let's talk about so, that. Yeah. How, um, how, how, what do you mean by that? Kind of the drifting among colonies. Okay. So we've been doing a, a lot of work on this, and this is something actually that we stumbled on um, through, uh, you know, uh, actually developing a mite aside, but also tracking uh, mite populations with our model, yeah. where the increase in the mite numbers was only due to mite reproduction. And as as you know, many of you know, varroa mites don't have an exceptionally high reproductive rate. You know, each female will go into, a mated female mite will go into like a worker cell and produce maybe one and a half new brood or new mites. Right. That's not a very high rate of increase, especially if you keep your mite levels real low, they're going to stay real low. But what we found when we were going into colonies and these were, uh, you know, beekeepers colonies, commercial colonies, 
when September hit, those mite numbers really took off. And they continued to take off. And our model predictions weren't worth anything because we were still predicting from reproduction is really low, you know, growth in the mite population where what we were seeing in the colonies was many, many times higher. So when you see this in a population, first thing that comes to mind is, geez, we got migration coming. These guys are coming in somewhere. So we began to do experiments to look at the relationship between the mite numbers in a colony and our frequency of capturing worker bees, foraging bees coming into the colony with mites on their bodies. And we saw uh, that as the frequency of foragers with mites on their bodies went up, so did our mite populations, both in sugar shakes at the phoretic stage, but also in the brood. So those mites are coming in and getting into the brood cells that are making up the the last brood cycles of the colony and uh, um, making it very difficult to have those healthy long-lived bees comprising the winter cluster. So importantly for our listeners, where are those mites coming from, right? Did they, did they leave with the mites on their bodies and they're coming back or they're obviously they're coming in from somewhere else. So how does that dynamic work? They're from, um, and this is uh, at this point, just a a mathematical explanation, but they're coming from somewhere else Mm -hmm. because if they were coming from the colony and, and, you know, coming back to the colony or coming from the colony and bursting essentially from that colony, we would have seen a reduction in the mite numbers or at least a stabilization of the mite numbers. But the fact that we saw these sharp increases indicates that they're coming in from somewhere else. Now we ask where that somewhere else is everywhere. Uh, it, uh, um, if you're a commercial beekeeper and you have a large apiary and, you know, you're picking up boxes because the colony has uh, died. Okay. They're probably coming from there, but they can come from colonies that are around you that maybe you don't even know, uh, exist. Uh, we have apiaries, uh, uh, at our lab, for example, we're we're having, I tell you, we we share your pain. We are having a heck of a time keeping our mite numbers low this mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, these are our research apiaries. Everybody's treating. And we have things under control in the apiaries, yet our numbers are still going up. So those mm-hmm. mites are coming in from colonies that are probably outside of our apiaries. Yeah, yeah. So it really shows the interconnectivity of all beekeepers and the population of beekeepers and their bees Right. So, you know, what you're doing affects your neighbor beekeepers and vice versa. Right. So if you allow your colony to just ramp up with mites and then it gets robbed out by your neighbors, you're then spreading your mites to them and then their colonies are going to have problems with mites subsequently. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's two ways of looking at this. And there is this, you know, um, colonies are getting robbed and mites are dispersing that way. Yeah. But the numbers that, that you know, we've uh, uh, got from measuring foragers with mites, it's more like this low background migration that's coming in. Uh, I, I compare it to like a dripping faucet that it, it, it's, not dripping very much, but if you put a bucket underneath it over two or, th- two or three days, you see how much water you're losing. And it's like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that whenever the bees are foraging, if mites are moving around mm-hmm. and they're foraging for several hours every day, mm-hmm. that after a week or two of that, what started out as maybe, you know, one mite per hundred bees can go up to seven or eight or nine mites per, per hundred bees. Right. And it's, it's the dripping faucet. Yeah. Well, it's an excellent analogy and it really kind of goes to show that there is a lot more kind of interconnectivity. And I hear all the time beekeepers like, well, you know, I don't, I live out in the middle of nowhere and there are no other beekeepers near me. Um, I hear that all the time, but a, you never really truly know that. And B there's also feral colonies out there and others. And, 
you just you just never really know unless you're on an island, <laughs> you know, and yeah. you really yeah. truly uh, can know that. So I think we we need to to have that assumption that there are other bees around us that could affect our bees and our bees can affect theirs. That should be the basal assumption until proven otherwise, right? Um, so, well, the, all of that work uh, that you guys have been doing on, on bee health and especially on varroa mites has really, really helped the research community. It's helped beekeepers and it's helped the industry as well. And so we, we really, really thank you for that. And um, as a result, want to invite you and everybody else here on the Zoom call um, to our next segment, which is our timely topic, which again is going to be on mites. And I just want to open it up for discussion. So, you know, Gloria, Don, Lewis, everybody else, feel free to, um, to chime in on these. And, and I thought it would just be easier to guide our discussions by talking about some of the misconceptions that may be out there in the beekeeping community about varroa mites, um, that we might be able to clear that up to, uh, to talk about and maybe dismiss some of those misconceptions so that they they might not cause problems. And so one of the ones that I hear quite frequently when it comes to uh, varroa mites is that, well, I don't see them, so I must not have them, right? Or I, I wait to see the deformed wings, or I wait to see the varroa mites on the backs of the bees before I do anything about it, right? Why do anything if they're not there, right? And this is a huge misconception because it's been shown in, in recent research. So this is um, uh, Sam Ramsey's study in PNAS where he showed that only about two, one to 2% of the mites on top of the bee and the mites that are, are crawling around on the, sur on the surfaces of the bees, only about 2% of them are on the top. The rest of them are underneath and they're hidden. So, and then the same thing with deformed wing virus. If you start seeing the symptoms, it's actually too late. <laughs> so, you know, the mites can be there before you even detect them. Um, and so I open that up to see, you know, what other people might think about that, about this misconception that if you don't see the mites, then they're not a problem. Can, can I, I just, you, you hit a, 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 a topic that, you know, and, and I, I don't want to, you know, dominate this or, or anything, but it's like so many things that it, it all has to do with frequency that you, you can have mites in your colony, but they're not at a level where you have a, a, a probability of finding them. Doesn't mean yeah. it's zero. That's right. It, it 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 means they're just not high enough for you to detect them. Yeah. And uh, that so many things are are like that. And what you say about deformed wing virus, if you see symptoms, then the deformed wing virus levels yep. in your entire colony are, are probably incredibly high. And I, I make a I make a distinction here too because. You can detect them with an alcohol wash or a sugar shake, but you might not, quote unquote, see them right on the surfaces of the bee. That's what I'm talking about here. People wait and they just scan the bees. And if they don't see any varroa mites, then they don't even bother to, to check them with a with a alcohol wash to verify that they're not there. Right. So that that's the misconception. Um you know, you, you can certainly detect them much more readily if you do one of these monitoring techniques, um, but just scanning and looking for them in like a passive way, that is not a good way to monitor for mites. Do you agree, Lewis? I would agree. I was, uh, Katie Lee at University of Minnesota, I think, did some of this work on her uh, PhD thesis where she was looking at colonies and, and kind of correlating, oh, if we, if we see a mite on a bee, uh, and we follow that colony down the road that just seeing a mite on a bee that negatively impacts its ability to overwinter. Or if you see deformed wing, that also um, kind of foretells how it's going to overwinter. And if you see a mite on a bee and deformed wing and, you know, it just really. Even I, more I, so I, it's an additive problem. Right, right. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I just, I, 
I feel like monitoring is so important. I can't stress it enough. It's I, what I say is we, we need good information to make it to good decisions. And monitoring is how we get that information. It, it is some work, but it sure does pay dividends. And uh, let me back up just what Lewis said. Um, from an inspector standpoint, at least, if you are someone who calls me, I had a call today where someone called me, talked about they lost the colony. The very first question I'm going to ask you is, what was your last mite count, especially this time of year? Did you treat? Have you treated yet? Um, so definitely do your alcohol washes, do your powdered sugar shakes this time of year. Same questions that I ask as well, uh, Bridget. And I always say you need to give me a decimal number, a decimal point. If you say, oh, I checked and they were low. No, no, no. That's not a count. Like you need actual numbers, <laughs> which means that you've actually done it. Not that you've just been scanning, right? And just looking and kind of guesstimating. This is, it's not a guessing game. It's, it's, a, it's actual measurement that you have to do, you know? So I think that's uh, kind of a big misconception that everybody really needs to, to move past and realize, no, it's, it's more active monitoring, not passive monitoring. I would also say it, I, have, I have about 30 colonies and I, I monitor all my colonies probably five times a year. And, and I'm seeing in my own, for, that's probably for the past three years, and I'm seeing in my own colonies that if I don't sample every colony, I'm going to miss the outliers. So it, almost at any time through the season, 10% of my colonies are wildly out of control for whatever reason. And if I'm only subsampling in my apiary, I'm probably going to lose, not catch those outliers and that's going to bite me. And so I, I know that sampling every colony is practically commercial beekeeper, but certainly for a backyard beekeeper, I think it's certainly doable and I think yeah. it's important to do. Yeah. No, that's great. Well, that kind of leads us into the, the second misconception here, um, which is a corollary to, to what you were just talking about there, Lewis, is that for some reason, a lot of a lot of beekeepers, especially new beekeepers say, well, if they just start out a new colony, especially from packages, you know, onto foundation, doesn't have any brood, um, you know, they don't have problems with mites in their first year, um, you know, because they don't have enough time for those mites to build up. So you, you don't have to worry about mites the first year. You have to worry about mites when you overwinter in the second year. And, and Gloria, based on everything that you were just talking about, about immigration, <laughs> that, is clear, that is clearly why that is not the case, right? Because it's not just growth within the colony where you get the mites. You can also get them from the outside, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the uh, uh, new colonies don't have mite problems. That used to be true. Yeah. Um, you know, they came in clean and, and you probably didn't have to treat. But since this mite has has changed over the years to, you know, become this this migratory pest. Yeah, nobody is safe. Yep. And so um, these are actually some data that Lewis kindly shared with me of some some colonies that he established this uh, past February or last February, I guess, in 2020. Um, and all of them started with no mites, except one. One had one mite out of 300 bees, right? So there's 0.33%. That was it. Um, and so if you went by that same philosophy, well, we just started out, verified that they had no mites to begin with. I don't need to worry about it this year, right? But look at what happened by the end of July. Look at the mite numbers, the percentages, right? Out of 300 bees, um, almost half of them were above the threshold where you need to do something as a beekeeper in order to knock those mites down to keep the bees healthy, right? Yeah. So remember that this is mites per 100 bees. This is percent infestation. I, and I kind of feel like I should probably just go ahead and put mites per half cup sample just to make it more alarming, like 16% infestation. That's 48 mites in my half cup sample, which I think is more hair raising than 16%. But yeah, true. Um, I see uh, also, I see a lot of beekeepers, especially new beekeepers that will start monitoring when they get their 
their bees and they'll monitor in May and June and they're not finding any mites. And they say, well, I guess I don't have any, I can give it up. And they, they give up that monitoring at exactly the wrong time, just before things are getting ready to pop. And so I would encourage people to get in the habit of making monitoring a regular part of your inspections every four to six weeks. Any other comments on that? As far as, you know, the new colonies no longer just being, you know, control free, that even new colonies need to be uh, monitored and actively uh, have a mite control program. Especially this time of year, again, um, this is just, this is really kind of a, the most important and delicate time, I think, for a lot of this stuff to, um, to come to a head. So I know it's hot out there. I know it can be, you know, hot, sticky, grimy, sweaty, but it's still uh, really, really critical. Things that you do right now will pay huge dividends this winter and going into next spring. Absolutely. Even in those new colonies, especially in those new colonies. So a third misconception is that a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, I did the right thing. I monitored for mites. I found, you know, fairly high levels of those mites. I took some sort of control measure, whatever that is. Um, and therefore, I don't have to worry about mites anymore this season. I took care of them. Um, I think that's a huge misconception because, you know, you first need to verify that whatever control uh, mechanism you used worked. And two, as we were saying before, you might be taking care of your mites and population within your colony, but they can be coming in from the outside from your neighbors. And so, um, you know, there's no guarantee necessarily that it will work for the rest of the season, right? Um, one time control is not something that you should completely rely on. Is that is that the case that everybody would agree with? Yeah. Yeah, I keep thinking about many years ago when we were discovering how uh, ineffective the apistan was. It was still killing some mites, but what was more important was how many mites were surviving. And uh, it, it was pretty dramatic how, how many of them did survive and it you know at the time you know this is back in the days when sticky boards were still in vogue and yeah you'd, you'd get a good sprinkling of mites on a sticky board but that wasn't that wasn't where it was happening i, I want to say i think beekeepers have uh too much confidence in the miticides i mean i think it's amazing that we have 10 or 11 products that can kill a small bug on a big bug but they're not silver bullets and they're not perfect. And we need to, I think we need to assume that whatever action we took didn't work and we need to go behind and verify, monitor, do that post route monitoring, find out if it worked or not. Yeah. And have a um, backup plan in our back pocket. What are we gonna do um, if that initial treatment was not effective? I, I just see so many beekeepers that feel like I took action, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. And I think that's only true if you're lucky 30% of the time. That's a great point. Yeah. Anybody else? I, Go ahead, I, Gloria. I think it's, I think it's difficult to, to know how effective a miticide is because the situation right. too is so dynamic that, uh, you know, when, when uh, we were um, developing, we used our model to, to see, okay, when's the best time to treat and what percentage of mites, sporadic mites, you know, realizing that there's also a lot of mites under the cells and uh, uh, under the caps, but uh, what percent of those sporadic mites over what period of time need to drop in order to keep mite levels no, low, not wipe them out, but just keep them low. And we found that if you were kill, able to kill off about 60 to 70% of the mites over about a two week window, you were able to knock down population so that they were low 
we were laboring under the assumption that the only way mites were coming into colonies was through reproduction. That was the only thing that was, was adding to our, our mite numbers. But with migration, I mean, it's just not the case anymore that uh, um, no matter how well a miticide may be working, first of all, that, that may be masked by the fact that you have these mites coming into your colonies. Some of those mites may be resistant to the miticide that you put in there. And it makes it look like, okay, this, these miticides aren't working, but the, the problem is, is that you just have this, you know, you're killing mites and then you also have a flow in through the door of, of new mites. And so, yeah, what you're saying about miticide treatments, um, you hate to recommend using so many miticide treatments, but geez, I don't know how you keep colonies alive. Yeah. Well, and actually, so I, I tried to be very careful Gloria, in, in my terminology, when I was saying a lot of times we equate treating for mites with synthetic acaricides, which some beekeepers yeah. don't like to use. Yeah. So I'm always trying to use the terminology controlling, right? So treating may be optional, but controlling is not, right? So there are many ways point. that you can control without using those synthetics, which, which is fine. But they often take a lot more work and a lot harder to implement. They may not be as effective. So, yeah. you know, I think, um, you know, con controlling mites. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You have to do it and it may have to do multiple things and multiple times and everything like that, but you necessarily don't necessarily have to use those uh, kind of harsher synthetics if that's not your kind of management plan, but you still have to have a management plan uh, for Varroa and for everything else. So, but part of that plan, as Lewis was saying, you need to have a backup plan in case your first efforts doesn't knock them down sufficiently, or you get a big kind of egress from, <laughs> or, um, um, influx from the outside, right? So you might be doing everything right, but you're getting things from your neighbors or something like that. And you, definitely need to uh to stay on top of it because of it it's a great point so let's quickly go to the um to the last misconception that we can talk about before we open it up to the just the general q a and so uh please make sure that you uh type in all of your questions on the on the youtube chat and we will get to those um in the in the last segment but just to underscore the fact that there's a misconception out there that as long as you do one thing to control the mites, then that should be fine. Um, you know, wh whatever you use is just going to be as good as anything else. Um, and that's not actually the, the, that's not actually true that not all control measures that you use are equally effective. Some of them can be very passive in their degree of manip manipulation where you don't have to do a whole lot. Others take a whole lot of work, right? But then you also have the efficacy of those actions, um, which again, some of them are pretty passive and they don't you know, control the mites very well. Others are much more effective and they really range all over the place. And so you really need to be aware that yes, there are multiple options that are out there, but they're not all the same. They're not all going to be equally as effective in those control measures. And so, um, you know, again, the variation out there of what is available out there is nice to have because then there are many options for beekeepers, but you really, really need to know the, the label, how to apply them effectively, and then uh, have a backup plan or have alternatives in case that approach um, needs to be augmented with something else. Your thoughts? Um, there, so you might've already said this, but if you did, I think it's great to emphasize um, that with this, all control measures are also not equally effective throughout the year. So like I have a lot of, um, I have had beekeepers who wanna to talk to me about non-chemical ways to control for uh, mites. And I say, you know, fall is maybe not the best time of year to be employing some of those uh, methods. It might be a little bit too late in the year for like drone root trapping, for example. 
Um, so also taking note of that, um, and then also same with our synthetics, you know, they're not all equal, equally applicable throughout the year. So just something too for beekeepers to be keeping in mind as they're thinking about their fall treatments. That's a great, great point, Bridget. Go ahead, Lewis. I just wanted to add it on your chart here. It looks like my tolerant stocks are the silver bullet with high efficacy and low degree of manipulation. And I, I'm not sure that's true. And uh, especially when we're talking about, you know, like Lori's talking about infestation from outside. So we may have stocks that are good at keeping uh, mite reproduction in the colony low, but how, how do they handle so that's a good point. I guess, yeah, I guess the way I was thinking about this was about um, within a single colony and just keeping that reproduction down. Uh, but as Gloria is correctly pointing out, that's the stuff you as your bee, beekeeper of your bees have control over, but you don't, might not have control over those other bees. So that influx from the outside is, is that X factor that is really, really hard for you uh, to be able to account for. So that's a great point. I just, I hear a lot of beekeepers say, I don't need to worry about mites because I've got a um, mite tolerant bees. stock. And uh, I, I think it, it really requires monitoring to, to uh, verify if what you were sold is what you, uh, what you got is what you th were marketed, right? <laughs> so <laughs> We did a, a study, actually, Bob Dank and I did a study with his Russian bees and, and uh, uh, measured mite populations, measured uh, uh, mite migration going into unselected lines and going into uh, uh, the Russian lines. And uh, by the time we, we got into November, the mite numbers were similar between the mite resistant and the uh, yeah. And the unselected lines, unfortunately, and it sort of speaks to that. You know, these mite tolerant stocks, they they really need to be widely used. That uh, uh, everybody's kind of on board with that, so that the mites in your geographic area are low, so it protects everyone. And if that doesn't happen, well, and the mite tolerant lines aren't really helping like they should. And I I, I definitely use the term mite tolerant because the term that's often used out there is resistant. So when you think resistant, yeah. it means no mites. And that is not the case. So to Lewis, I totally capitulate to your point, Lewis. It's like, just because you have one of these genetic stocks that is good at hygienic behavior or some of these other things that can help reduce the reproduction rate of the mite, doesn't mean there's no mites. It doesn't mean that the influx of mites from, from outside um, you know, they're going to be able to take care of that. Right. So it's, again, it's one option of multiple different control measures, but you're never going to just be able to rely on just one. Right. Your, your varroa management plan has to be a cluttered toolbox with a lot of different stuff in it. <laughs> you can't have just one miticide. You can't have just one non-chemical method. Uh, you okay. have to have a lot of tools in your toolbox and you have to, it has to include monitoring so you know when you need to add or if your plan is working. Yeah, that's great. Well, well, thanks so much, guys. I see that we have a lot of really great uh, questions coming in here from the audience on our YouTube. So please uh, keep coming. I'm going to try and cherry pick some of these uh, uh, focusing on the mites first before we broaden it out to just kind of some general questions. Uh, so one here is that... Um, Question that oxalic app, uh, vaporization on packages, should that be a requirement for vendors? Because it's a lot easier for the vendors to do it than for new beekeepers to do it. What are some thoughts on that? Uh, if I'm going to do a treatment, I want to do the treatment. I want to be responsible for the treatment. Yeah. If I'm going to pay for, if I'm going to pay a premium, I want to. I want to yeah, take I, care of it. <laughs> I, I don't think we could mandate the uh, vendors to doing that. They might be willing to do that. They might even incorporate that in their marketing program. But uh, yeah, we can't. We can't mandate that. Yeah, there is a good point there, saying that it's it's easier for kind of larger, more experienced beekeepers like you, Lewis, to be to be able to do that. 
but for beginner beekeepers or for kind of smaller beekeepers that may not feel comfortable with doing that, um, you know, that, that is a good point. So, yeah. So I, I hear, I'm hearing that it's probably not good to, to mandate it, but maybe there are some opportunities there. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, something to, to talk with your vendors or whoever's supplying those packages or, uh, personally, I think that we should get away from packages per se, and we should maybe think more about local, locally supplied nukes and splits, um, instead of packages. But I think that's a different discussion. So we'll leave yeah, that for every, another time. <laughs> so every beekeeper, their goal should be to not buy bees. Right. Yes. Your goal is point. to, once you have a couple of colonies, you've got what you need to make right. your own bees. So make your own split. <laughs> Um, here's another question about any concerns about miticide resistance. That is a really important issue. And again, Gloria, I know that you've done some work on that. So your thoughts on miticide resistance? Well, you know, it's a pest management problem. And, and so, uh, you know, rotating uh, the uh, treatments that you use is going to be the best way to, to manage resistance. And like you said, we have a lot of products out there. Um, and, um, you know, I realized one of the things is, you know, it's uh, you, you, you buy a treatment and, you know, you, you buy all it's like, you know, sort of like shopping at Costco. You know, you can't buy a, just a little bit of it. And so if if you have a bee club or some kind of bee community, if each of you buy a treatment and then share it so that you can all be rotating. That may be a way to get around uh, using the same treatment over and over again without having to buy six or seven different treatments. So there's another question here uh, dealing with the mites and just saying, uh, so should beekeepers plan to control again and again, given the influx of the mites. But I think it's back to monitor. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. may not have, you may be a lucky person yeah. and not have the, uh, yeah. an influx of mites, or you may be unlucky and you do, but the monitoring is the key. Yep. Right. Because yeah, should they, plan to monitor again and again. And to, right. Um, yeah. The, 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 some, the thought years, of treatment uh, again and again is, you know, again, we're talking about putting in materials. We're not talking about control, like, you know, make a differentiation between treatment and control. If you're talking about applying materials, you're, you're, you're missing the point, you, you know, and you are probably breeding for resistance by the mites. Uh, I was going to say, I think some years is also just worse than other years. Some years, like, it seems yeah. like just light levels of mites, and then next year might be horrible. So that's another. Right. Yep. I remember Jeff Harris talking about that, how some years the mites just didn't seem to be nearly as problematic as the preceding year. Yeah, and lots of different things go into that, like the how warm the spring was so that, you know, how quickly they built up or how stressful the summer was and lack of forage so that they're more immunocompromised. And, you know, yeah, so there's so many factors that go into it. It's, it's very, very hard to predict. Um, so here's some other questions that, uh, you know, aren't necessarily dealing with, um, with mites per se, but uh, here's a question just uh, about having their supers, their honey supers are still on and they want to know, you know, what's kind of the last date that you should pull them or what, what should you do if you still have honey on your colonies around this time of year? Anybody want to cover that? Is it better to leave it on and let them overwinter with it or is it still okay to take it off and sling That's it out? Situational too. That that kind of depends on the configuration of the colony. You, you certainly want to have the bees have enough in the lower chambers, but um, 
most parts of North Carolina, we're not going to be making any surplus from this point on. So, you know, see how heavy the lower boxes are and then harvest what's left. Or put it above an inner cover at the very least. Let them rob it back. All right. All right. I think we only really have time. It's uh, just after eight here. So I'm going to just leave for one last question here and saying that uh, there's... Um, Bee beekeepers have some colonies that are pretty defensive right now. <laughs> um, any, any advice about how to monitor for the mites during this time of year when the bees are naturally very defensive? Any quick advice uh, that somebody might want to give when they're out there and the bees are pretty stingy? Suit up to go. <laughs> I was going to say, in addition to suit up, I always do my rolls last. Very last thing I do, um, because it's going to make them mad. I, I John, I think you had something there. No, I, I didn't quite hear everything that Bridget said. I'm sorry. <laughs> she was saying oh, she I, leaves her mite uh, monitoring to last. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think John was getting ready to say something. Yeah. I don't know if my speaker's working, but... It, just you know you just got to suit up yeah i mean you got to put gloves on you got to smoke them um and i did look at some bees today that were bringing in honey from soybeans and they were very gentle they were happy uh sort of surprising but we've had enough rain that the soybeans are actually producing some nectar this year that's very unusual for us and i have a commercial beekeeper and he was fussing about the honey because he's trying to make splits and he's fighting the honey they're bringing in but that's well, unusual for us. No, that's right. You know, when it's warm and there's a big nectar flow on, the bees are all happy and you can go out there in a t-shirt and shorts, no problem. But when it's hot and there's not a lot of food coming in, they can just naturally be pretty, uh, pretty defensive. And I know Gloria is just sitting back there thinking, oh my goodness, you guys have no idea compared to us <laughs> in Africanized bee country. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you guys yeah. do for monitoring for mites um, in, in some very testy or purpose -led for your research apiaries on Africanized bees? Um, well, first of all, I mean, we, we buy a lot of queens. So we have, you know, European uh, bees in those colonies, but they can also be testy. But, uh, uh, you know, I did a lot of work with African bees. Uh, um, and it just exactly what everyone's uh, saying is that you really you suit up can really get that smoker going. I used to have these smoker mixtures that would just, you know, I mean, there was lots of wood chips and mesquite and, you know, there was some burlap at the bottom and that thing would just be smoking like crazy. And I never worked them by myself. I always had a, somebody there, they were the smoker. And, uh, you know, the other person was just manipulating through this cloud of, of smoke just to kind of keep them down. But uh, yeah, it's hard. And yeah, what Bridget said, that's, that, you know, Doing the mean ones last and doing the hard stuff last. That's that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll follow you around till you get in the truck, right? That's right. That's right. Well, that's all. Wondering. That's all great advice. Go ahead, Lewis. Sorry. Remind North Carolina beekeepers that if they have a colony that is testy in May or June, that's probably the best time to uh, requeen because they're going to be real jerks in August. And so, if you have that, <laughs> that outlier colony that's you know, less patient, much less patient than others early in the season. They're gonna really gonna show it in August, and it's uh, it's I, very hard to requeen these large colonies in August when they're so big and yeah. mean. And so, kind of uh, keep an eye on try to try to weed those jerks out earlier in the season. Now, these are queen right colonies you're talking about, Lewis. Not not ones that are just out coming out of the interim, right? <laughs> no, those are all really good points. And um, thanks everybody for, uh, for answering those. And sorry, everybody, if we couldn't get uh, to your questions, we always get way more questions than, than we ever have time for. So apologies, but uh, keep them coming. And, and thank you so much for asking them. Um, I'm going to wrap things up here by saying that we are doing these apiculture onlines uh, the last Wednesdays of, of every month. So our next one is going to be September 29th. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, the benefits of moving hives to improve your overwintering. 
Um, and our special guest is going to be uh, Brock Harper from Purdue University, who has been doing a lot with genetics and genomics on, on bees and is um, uh, a real kind of rising star in, in honeybee research. And so be sure to join us next time. Until then, thank you so much, Gloria, for joining us from, from Tucson, well, Arizona, you, for really fantastic um, information that you provided us tonight. Everybody else on the panel, as always, for, for being here, for contributing. Thanks, everybody, for, um, for joining us this evening. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and like and comment on our YouTube site. And hopefully we'll see you next Apiculture Online. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.